Would you join me in prayer, please? Father God, we just come before you today. and Lord, there's something very clear in your word today. And that is your passion to go beyond any means necessary to reach people. Lord, as we as a people tend to take the comfortable position and tend to take the place that feels the best, Lord, you are relentlessly pursuing people. And so, Lord, I thank you for doing that to us. Those of us that know you, Jesus, we, if we can get to a point where we take your grace for granted and we think somehow, some way, that entitles us to to sit back and relax. But Lord, if we want to be a part of what you're doing, then we need to go and be where you are doing things. And, and Lord, so we, we ask that you'd use your word with power today to, to touch us wherever we need to be touched, Lord. If there's, there's so many levels in today's scripture. There's plenty of places for everyone to relate. To you. So Lord Jesus, would you use your word with power? Would you change our hearts? Would you renew our minds? Lord, help us to be the people you've called us to be. We pray this in your name, Lord Jesus. Amen. We're continuing our series on grace. We have been over, we've, we're kind of five weeks into the series now. Uh, just kind of want to give you a little bit of a snapshot of where we're going. Uh, we are now transitioning. We've been working our way uh, for the last four weeks to the Old Testament. Uh, and now we're moving into the New Testament. And our plan is, is we're going to take this series all the way up to Advent, which is the first Sunday after Thanksgiving. So we've been kind of working through things. We've been trying to uh, rein in mankind's uh, kind of the modern understanding of what grace is. We've been talking about how true grace is uh, not just, uh, for you know, God doesn't just overlook our sin. Uh, God has a plan to redeem us. And there's this, there's this part of grace where we have to turn to God. You know, kind of the old, um, you know, the old word, you must repent. Uh, you know, we use the word repentance for a, lot of, for a lot of people that don't typically go to church. That word repent is kind of one of those old church words, and, and people don't always know what it means. They hear it all the time. Repenting means to turn to God. So in other words, we as a people, all of us at some point, uh, we are going on a path that takes us away from God. If, we, if that were not the case, if we had this great knowledge of God, we wouldn't need the Bible to reveal God to us. But that's not the case. Our tendency as a fallen creation is to turn away from God and pursue things other than God. And that really is the definition of sin. How it plays out and what it is, it all is basically the same thing. It's our way of seeking something away from God. And, and, and that, you, you can kind of, you, you know, that's like an all-encompassing description of sin. So often when we talk about sin, there's probably some of you that, that maybe gravitate towards a specific sin. But even when we talked about Jonah last week, there, there are sins of commission, which are things that we do, there are sins of omission, which are things we don't do. So the, the, the greatest way to describe sin is when we're basically doing whatever we want and we don't care what God has to say about any of it. That's sin. And so we have this, uh, we, we've seen throughout the scripture, we've seen God's response to sin. He's not cool with it. He created us. He created us in his image. And it's not okay for us to live a life where we don't care about God. That's not okay. But what God does is he doesn't just sit there and, and he, 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 his approach is he's got his arms open. He's like, come back to me. Come to me. Here's the truth. Come to me. And that, that's throughout the, throughout the scripture, that's God's way of revealing himself to us and saying, hey, here I am. This is who I am. Come to me. Come to me. Well, uh, throughout the Old Testament, we see that. As we talked earlier, God didn't just suddenly change when Jesus came on the scene. Jesus is God. Jesus is God taking on human flesh. 
and he becomes this tangible image of God. Scripture says that Jesus is the visible image of the invisible God. So Jesus didn't change who God was. Jesus just revealed to us greater depths of who God is. And so that's where we're going today. We're going to see an exchange between Jesus and a Samaritan woman in John chapter 4. Now, now before we get there, I want to kind of give you a little context for where we're going. I'm going to throw a lot of scripture at you today. Um, So you can just kind of listen or you can follow along. This is not going to be on the screen. I just want you to hear this. We're going to start with uh, John 3, verse 31, before we get to chapter 4. But in John 3, verse 31, John the Baptist is talking about Jesus. Now remember, John the Baptist's job was to testify about Jesus and to point people to Jesus. And this is what he said. He, He says that he, Jesus, has come from above and is greater than anyone else. We are of the earth and we speak of earthly things, but he has come from heaven and is greater than anyone else. He testifies about what he has seen and heard, but how few believe what he tells them. How few will believe. Anyone who accepts his testimony can affirm that God is true, for he is sent by God. He speaks God's words, for God gave him the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, without limit. The Father loves his Son and has put everything into his hands. And anyone who believes in God's Son has eternal life. Anyone who doesn't obey the Son will never experience eternal life, but remains under God's angry judgment. So this is the context for which we're going into. I wish I could say that you know grace means that that God no longer sends people to hell. That's not grace. Grace has God is a just God. He is a holy God. He has to deal with our sin. And so his way of offering eternal life in spite of our sin is Jesus. We come up with all kinds of ways we think are good ways. But God has said this is the way. It's not a way, it's the way. Now we can kind of say, oh, well, you know, I, I don't believe that. Well, <laughs> I, don't, I don't know what to tell you. Um, I, this, there's a reason why Jesus came. There's a reason why God left heaven and took on flesh. There's a reason why Jesus suffered and died on this earth. It's because God is passionate about the way. And so he's offering, again, it's this open invitation. Grace says, you don't have to earn the way. I've made the way. You just have to turn to me. Grace says, I don't care where you've been. I don't care what you've done. I don't care what your skin color is. I don't care your economic class. I don't care any of that stuff. The invitation is made. Now come. And so this is this posture that we have in John chapter 4. And we see in Jesus the relentless, passionate heart of God to redeem people. I just want to say another one thing before we get into the text. Churches and Christians forget this all the time. Churches and Christians, we get on another track. And and what God does throughout Scripture is He makes it very, very clear what He's doing. He is reaching people. He's redeeming people. He's offering people salvation. When we make it anything other than that, we're missing it. We just, we're, we're, we're you know, that, that's kind of the all-encompassing um, piece of this that's so vitally important. So it's in this context we get to chapter 4, starting with verse 1. So Jesus knew the Pharisees had heard that he was baptizing and make more disciples than John, though Jesus himself didn't baptize them as his disciples did. So he left Judea and returned to Galilee. Let me give you a little, I'm going to stop right there. Let me give you a little geography lesson. So if you look at Israel, you have Jerusalem. And then if you go straight north, you have the Sea of Galilee. So Jerusalem going up to Galilee. Well, the area, the region between Galilee and Jerusalem that area is Samaria. Now, what if you look, if you look on a map and you go, so here's Jerusalem, here is Galilee, Samaria is in between. What a lot of people did is they, you know, the Jews hated the Samaritans. And quite frankly, the Samaritans weren't too fond of the Jews. 
So what a lot of Jews did when they were traveling between Galilee and Jerusalem is they took a little side road that went to Jericho. And then from Jericho, there's actually a mountain range. And then there's a road that heads north paralleling uh, the mountain range. So they, they actually went clear around Samaria. Uh, and so this is, you know, this, is, this was very common, and this is the way it was. So Jesus is leaving Jerusalem, and he's headed to Galilee. We know that the, the bulk of Jesus' ministry was around the Sea of Galilee. But we also know that Jesus had already, according to the book of John, entered into the, uh, the temple of Jerusalem and turned over the money changers. He actually kind of, he did this more than once. In some of the other gospels, it's later on in the gospel, but he just, every time he walk into the temple, he, he'd see all these money changers, and he'd, he'd kind of chastise the priests and the, the rulers of the age. So, they, so he already was kind of under scrutiny by the religious establishment. And so he was headed to Galilee. It says in verse 4 that he had to go through Samaria on the way. I want to stop there. He didn't have to. It's not like he couldn't have gone around it. So, so as we start to kind of unpack this, and this is kind of one of these areas when we, when we study Scripture, and it says that he had to go through Samaria, the first thing you say to yourself, if you know your geography, is you say, well, he didn't have to. So why does it say, why did John write that he had to? And the answer is pretty simple. He had a divine appointment in Samaria. We understand that Jesus is God, Jesus is all pow- he, he, he's all powerful. He's God in the flesh. He's under, he's completely anointed by the Holy Spirit. He is totally under submission to God the Father. And so he had, there was, there was a rescue operation that had to go on in Samaria. Jesus went in there for this purpose, to save this woman. And, and I just want to stop there because I want you as an individual to see how much God loves you. I, I know sometimes, I get, the, I get the fact, sometimes we feel like we just kind of snuck in, right? That God didn't actually pursue us. God doesn't really actually care about us. We're just kind of in with the crowd. But you have to understand, just as Jesus went on this mission specifically to reach this woman and the people in this village, Jesus goes on a mission to reach you. That's how much, as an individual, you matter to Jesus. Now, why is that important? Because he's still doing this. And there's people out there right now that Jesus loves and that Jesus wants to reach, and the chosen vessel by which he does that is us. So we have to understand that complacency and comfort is not beneficial to this. Because these people are oftentimes in areas where maybe we don't want to go, i.e. Samaria. But God goes anyway. So here we go. We get back to our text. He had to go through Samaria on the way. Eventually, he came to the Samaritan village of Sychar near the field that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired from the long walk, sat wearily beside the well about noontime. John, who wrote the book of John, toward the end of his life, he was the only disciple, the only apostle that lived to an old age. All the other apostles, disciples, were martyred. They were killed for the gospel. John lived to be an old man. Well, if you understand your history of the church, and you understand everything that went on in the region, John, toward the end of his life, he became known as the great theologian. And the reason why he was so, he was so revered and such a great theologian is that the, after Jesus had ascended to heaven, the early church wanted to somehow strip Jesus of his humanity. You see, they just couldn't believe that God became a human. So they kind of theorized and developed a theology that Jesus, that, that God kind of made himself look like a human. That he kind of appeared to us as a human, but in reality, he was the spirit. He couldn't have possibly indwelt flesh and taken on flesh because, you know, uh, kind of um, Greek philosophy thought that there was a difference between the spirit and the flesh, and the, and the flesh was just all bad. 
And, and so th- there was kind of this separation. But Jesus was fully man. And he was fully God. That, that's the miracle of, of what Jesus did. But you see, he, he was tired. He was weary. You know, if you're familiar with this area, kind of an interesting, if you've ever been to the Middle East, you've ever been to Israel, one of the things they tell you is you need to drink water even really if you're not thirsty. You need to, you need to, it, it, we, went, we went in August when we went to this area, and they said you need to make yourself drink continuously throughout the day because it's so dry and arid that you are losing tons of fluid through your skin, but you don't even know it because it doesn't, you don't really sweat. You actually, the arid temperature and the sun, it just sucks the moisture right off of you. But you're really, you know, here, you, if you lose a lot of water, you see every ounce of it. There, it, go, it, it gets zapped off of you, gets turned to gas immediately, and, and so you don't even know how much water you're losing. But that, this is the nature of that climate. So Jesus is walking through this region. It, it's basically, it's an arid region. And he was exhausted he was tired, he was weary. And he comes, it says he, came, he, uh, he was sitting by Jacob's well, which also, by the way, is still there. Jacob's well was a cistern that was fed by a natural spring. It's still there. You could go, if you go to this part of the country, you could visit Jacob's well. And it says that it was about noontime, so it was the hottest time of the day. It was the middle of the day. The sun was directly overhead, and it was probably a scorcher. And it says that uh, soon, verse 7, a Samaritan woman came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, please give me a drink. So, a couple things here. Number one, since it was a well, Jesus didn't have a container to get water. So he's sitting by this well, and of course the water is down there, and he can't really reach it. So, so he's, you know, he's kind of waiting for this woman to come along. Again, th- there's a there's a divine appointment here. But this woman, it's interesting that she would come to this well alone. This was not something that women did in that culture. They don't even do it today. If you go to kind of a third world country where people have to go to wells to get their water, you very rarely see women go alone. It's usually kind of a social event. They all kind of show up in the morning and they get their water and, and they're talking as they bring, you know, they'll put it on top of their heads and they'll be, they'll be carrying this water and they'll be talking. It's a big social event. So this woman was an outcast. She was coming at the hottest time of the day because she was trying to avoid people. She'd been shunned by the rest of the village. And so here's Jesus talking to this woman and he says to her, give me a drink. Please give me a drink. Now, a couple things here you need to know culturally. Number one, unmarried men did not talk publicly to unmarried women, or women for that regard. That was, that was actually a, a, that was PDA back then. For a man to talk to a woman, it, that was a public display of affection. You did not do that. Uh, so that was kind of scandalous. But number two, Jews and Samaritans did not ever talk to each other. Let me remind you, last week I talked to you about the Assyrians and how the Assyrians invaded uh, the northern part of Israel. And what the Assyrians did, uh, they, what, what, the way that they would kind of bring people under control is they would invade a country and they would export the people of that country throughout their empire. And then they would import people from throughout their empire into that country. So what they did, what they did with this area after they, they conquered uh, the northern kingdoms, the northern uh, ten kingdoms of Israel, is they took all the Jews, sent them throughout the Assyrian Empire, brought in Gentiles from all over their empire into Samaria, and what happened was is the people commingled. They married. They they it, it was it's kind of this uh, they, the Jews. It was actually kind of a racism issue to them. Because the Jews that lived in that area, they commingled with Gentiles. And that was a big deal. They didn't like that at all. The other thing that happened to the Samaritans is they also, by, they got their, their religious practices got diluted by all the other pagan rituals. They all came in and people started 
uh, doing all these different things together. They had this conglomerate kind of religion uh, that had some shreds of truth, but also a lot of other pagan nonsense. Uh, and so that was what was going on in Samaria as well. Which is kind of interesting, because we kind of see that in America today. People, you know, people kind of sometimes think, well, you know, um, when it comes to religion, they just kind of shoot down the middle. They pick uh, a little bit out of this one, a little bit out of this one. Oh, I, you know, I really like that there. I'll take some of that. Oh, you know what? That's kind of cool. I'll take some of that. And let's throw in some... Uh, Let's throw in some astrology and, and maybe some mysticism and we'll just get that all in one big pile, we'll stir it together, and that's my religion. Well, that's not truth. It's not the pure truth. And so that's kind of what you have in Samaria. So Jesus says to her, please give me a drink. It says in verse 8, he was alone at the time because his disciples had gone into the village to buy some food. So here's, here's Jesus and this woman, just one-on-one should not happen but jesus did it verse 9 the woman was surprised for jews refused to have anything to do with samaritans she said to jesus you are a jew and i am a samaritan woman why are you asking me for a drink now i want to stop right here in, in a little bit we're going to find out that this woman part of her issue is that she has had multiple male partners in her life and so she, I'm going to make the argument that at this point, I don't know, some, some, uh, some uh, um, scholars kind of theorize that she might have been a prostitute. I don't know that that's true, because it doesn't say that. But I think it, when this conversation begins with Jesus, she is questioning his motives. So she walks up to this, she's probably a little jaded with men. Men have probably treated her terribly throughout her life so she's going to naturally assume that when she encounters a man he has an agenda and i think you can kind of guess what that is from her perspective she didn't know who she was talking with but you, her response is kind of like um what are you why why are you asking me for a drink what do you really want what's what's going on here and Jesus replied in verse 10, If you only knew the gift God has for you and who you are speaking to, you would ask me and I would give you living water. So Jesus immediately turns what she's doing into a connection with God. If you ever, if you ever understand ways of effective evangelism, you've got to meet people where they're at. You have to be in a place where people are going about their business, living a life oblivious to God. And somewhere in the midst of their life, you have to make a connection to God. And so, so I mean, that's just, the way that I'm wired is when I talk to people that I don't know, I'm waiting for the opening to bring God into the conversation. So I, you know, that it, it, it's just, kind of how it is because i understand what our point of being here is i'm not here to have this really good life where i do whatever i want to do i am an ambassador for god not just because i'm a pastor but because i'm a christian so every conversation i ever have with anybody if i truly understand what scripture says i'm waiting for an opening to turn the talk into a talk that at least starts to lead to God. Now, I, I, there's an art to doing this. And you've got, I mean, you've got to be, you've got to be somewhat sensical on this. You've got to be somewhat wise in the ways that you do this. But the point is, is that you're trying to get to people where they're at and trying to get them to understand that there's something bigger. You see, the, the core of what Jesus is saying is he's saying, I know what you're looking for, even though you don't really. Let me let you in on a little secret about every human being on earth. They're all looking for something. The reason why so many people, the reason why we do so many things that are just, you know, not good for us, and why do we act the way that we do, is because ultimately, deep down inside, we're looking for something. We're looking for joy. We're work, looking for happiness. We're looking for meaning. We're looking for significance. 
That, that's what's happening. And the problem is we seek it elsewhere. We seek it through, uh, you know, drugs, drinking, um, you know, sex, all the things that we do as a people that we think are going to give us happiness. We're looking for something. And Jesus says, you know what? What you're looking for, only I can give. He starts to bring this peace in there. And, and, and you know, so oftentimes, so oftentimes, we go out looking for stuff, and we think, okay, this is good. All right, I, I could be happy with this. And then something happens. We all are kind of, whether we want to admit it or not, we're all out to answer certain questions in life, such as, why am I here, and what happens when I die? Whether we're actually asking those questions to ourselves, these are questions that, you know, we're here, and we die. And the question is, why? Is there no reason? Is there no meaning to it? Or is there actual reason and meaning to it? So we're looking for answers. And Jesus, in a sense, is, is inserting himself into this place, and he's saying to this woman, I am the, the true person that you're thirsting for. The conversation goes on. He says, I would give you living water. Uh, it, it, it's this picture of flowing water. Stagnant water is bad water. Living water, flowing water, this is, this is clean water. This is cleansing water. This is, this is the most ideal water that you can find. Living water. But sir, you don't have a rope or a bucket, she said, and this well is very deep. Where would you get this living water? She's actually being sarcastic. Just kind of like, okay. All right, how are you going to do this? And besides, do you think you're greater than our ancestor Jacob who gave us this well? How can you offer better water than he and his sons and his animals enjoyed? Jesus continues, he replied, anyone who drinks this water will soon become thirsty again, but those who drink the water I give will never be thirsty again. It becomes a fresh bubbling spring within them, giving them eternal life. This is the peace that is most important. It's this process that begins this side of heaven, and it lasts for eternity. You see, one of the things that we're doing as, as Christians, those of us that are Christians, is we are learning, we should be learning more and more and more in our lives how to seek satisfaction from God. Because that's what we'll do for eternity. So it's almost kind of like, imagine if you would, part of the understanding of this whole process is that Jesus is connecting to people that are finding all their meaning, understanding, and satisfaction apart from God. And so he comes, we get through faith in Jesus, we become connected to God. Now what happens next is we go through this process. We, we are learning to be satisfied in God. Instead of turning to the old things we used to turn to before we knew God, now we turn to God. And that, that's the life of a disciple, of a believer. That's the way that it should be going and so that's, that, that's, one of the reason, that's one of the reasons why uh, it, it's so troubling that churches and Christians forget this. And, and, and let me tell you what happens when a church or a Christian forgets this. They come to God, but now they figure they can have the best of both worlds. Now I can have the world and salvation. So while I'm here on earth, I can live for myself. I can get whatever I want. I can completely ignore God's desire to reach people. And I can be totally focused on myself. What? Uh, uh, that person over there isn't saved? Well, you know what? I hope, I hope they do get saved. I'm going to keep doing what I'm doing. I, I'm totally into what I'm into. And it has nothing to do with God. And, and see, that's... That, and so what you get is you get churches, you get a bunch of people that call themselves Christians that gather in a building, and they could absolutely care less about the unsaved. And that is sad. That is tremendously sad. And, you know, we have to continually remind ourselves that there is a bigger thing going on around us 
than whatever it is that we're into. Jesus goes on. He continues. He says that uh, um, after he tells this to this woman, now he's starting to get through to her, but she still doesn't fully understand. Please, sir, the woman said, give me this water. Then I'll never be thirsty again, and I won't have to come here to get water. So she's thinking, okay, so I don't have to make these trips, these public trips to this well. Um, You know, I'm in. Give me the water. Now Jesus gets to what is at the heart of her thirst and her hunger, and that is her shame and her pain. And And immediately he says to her, go and get your husband. Jesus told her, and she says, I don't have a husband, the woman replied. Jesus said, you're right, you don't have a husband, for you have had five husbands, and you aren't even married to the man you're living with now. You certainly spoke the truth. I want to stop right there. This woman's life is broken. And part of the reason why it's broken is because of the way the people have treated her, but make no mistake about it, she's made a lot of decisions that have brought her to this place. She had a rotten reputation. She, was, she, was, she had five husbands, five different men that she had been married to, and now she was living with a man. I, I just want to stop, and, and, and I want to I interject something here a little bit. Sexual sin is a big deal to God. We in our society have minimized it. We say, oh, well, you know, it's what everybody does. It's okay. I was watching this TV show the other day, and uh, they had this scene on there, very popular TV show, they had this scene on there where the guy gets down on his knee and he has this little, he has this little thing, and he gets down on his knee and he opens it, and it's a key. And she's just like, oh, are you asking me to move in with you? And he said, yes. And it was like this big romantic move. And I'm sitting there watching that and I go, what a bunch of crud. But, you know, we get bombarded with that. And you know what it is? We think, oh, you know what? (laughs) That's so sweet and romantic. No, it's not. No, it isn't. And see, Jesus, here's, here's the part that they don't tell you in these TV shows. There is a physical, psychological, and spiritual bond that occurs between every single person, whoever is intimate. Every time a man and a woman get together and they experience intimacy, There is a connection made. Let me tell you about a little thing called oxytocin. Oxytocin is a chemical that your body releases at certain times in your life. The one time in a woman's life where there is this massive amount of oxytocin release is when she has a baby. It's known as the bonding chemical. It's this chemical where a a woman looks at a baby and she is so bombarded with this chemical that she would she would die for that child immediately that's oxytocin working oxytocin the same thing is released during intimacy and it's this bonding chemical you see there's i want to just say this i want to say this i I know it's one of those things but i got to get it out there there is no such thing as casual sex it's not true society may tell you it is But the reality is, over time, it hurts you. And it's one of those things that makes life challenging. But the good news is, is Jesus can redeem you. He can redeem anything. But he's not going to overlook our sin. Because sin, it does hurt us. And there's a residual effect of our sin. And so we have to know that part of what Jesus wants to do in our lives is under the surface. And, and that, that's why superficiality, uh, worship, and superficial, that, that is no way to be. The Holy Spirit, Jesus himself, wants to get under the hood and go to work. And so that's what he does with this woman. He gets to the place where, where her pain resides. And he doesn't condemn her. He doesn't call her names. He meets her there in love. And it's almost as if he says, you know what, I know this is hurting you, but I want to help. And so he goes there. He says, you certainly spoke the truth. Sir, the woman said, you must be a prophet. 
he touched her. Now, what's interesting is that she backtracks. So the, the conversation is going deeper and deeper and deeper, and then as soon as he touches on her deepest pain, she wants to pull out of the process. And she immediately goes to a question, a theological question. Uh, she says, so tell me why is it that you Jews insist that Jerusalem is the only place of worship while we Samaritans claim it is here in Mount Gerizim where our ancestors worshipped? What's that got to do anything? As I read this, I thought to myself, you know, this is not unlike when you're talking with somebody and you ever had one of those conversations with someone and the spirit really is heavy and you're getting to a deep place with somebody and all of a sudden they pull out? And they'll, you know, they'll say something like, well, uh, uh, you don't really believe that God created the earth in six days, do you? What's that got to do with anything? Are we talking about Jesus? But they immediately go to something, some kind of a theological debate that can pull out of this deep uh, place, which is where God is touching them. Jesus doesn't really react to that. He says, he, 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 he kind of says to her, verse 21, Believe me, dear woman, a, a term of affection, the time is coming when it will no longer matter whether you worship the Father on this mountain or in Jerusalem. We're getting to something bigger here. You Samaritans know very little about the one you worship, while we Jews know all about him, for salvation comes to the Jews. I want to stop right there. God is revealing himself through Scripture. Don't buy into the lie that any religion, all religions out there lead to God. There is only one way. Not, Jesus is not a way. He's the way. Jesus is the complete revelation of God to people. And so, so oftentimes people kind of think, oh, well, you know what? Um, it just doesn't really matter what your faith is, just as so long as you believe in God. But you see, only one has been given the, it's like the road map that leads to the God. And it starts through the Old Testament and it's completed in the New Testament. And that's what Jesus is saying. He's saying that, that, that salvation comes through the Jews. The Jews are what God is doing until Jesus. And now it begins, uh, with, it continues with Jesus. He goes on to say, verse 23, but the time is coming, indeed it is here now, when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. Stop right there. Spirit, lowercase s. That's a big deal. It's not the Holy Spirit. What John is saying here as he wrote this, is he's saying is, is that true worship, it happens in here. Where your spirit resides and where the Holy Spirit and your spirit collide. You have a spirit. This is your eternal spirit. And th this is this essence of who you are. So, so it's this idea that you relate and interact with God deep down inside. We make it all external. So oftentimes when I'm worshiping, you know, I've, I've had people tell me, they watch me when I worship, and it's all right. It's one of those things you get used to as a pastor. You know, people are kind of watching what you're doing, and that's all right. But sometimes, if you watch me worship, what you'll see is that I'm actually, my eyes are closed. And what I'm doing in that moment is I am, I'm right here. And, I'll, and if it's kind of the first time of the day, I'm saying, Lord, you know, convict me of my sin. Forgive me for my sins. And I'm interacting in that deep place. And oftentimes in that deep place, that's when God is giving me stuff that I didn't even know. I'm not, I'm not going to, my conclusion is not that I'm unworthy. My conclusion is thank you. Please forgive me. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your grace. And it's this part that you go through. He says that, uh, um, he goes on to say the time is coming in spirit and truth. The Father is looking for those who will worship him that way. For God is spirit, lowercase, or uppercase s. So those who worship him must worship in spirit, lowercase s, and truth. Sincerity. Right here, at the heart. That's where true worship resides. You know, for a lot of people, maybe they start to go there, and then 
what's here is just way too painful. So we pull out. And then we look for something superficial. I need something superficial. You know, I talk, you know, obviously, if you don't know me, I come from a very conservative, religious background. High church, high religion, high ritual. They, they had what they called liturgy. And we would come and we'd do basically the same thing every week. But what was interesting about that is that in itself had no power to change anybody. Do you know how many people I've talked to as a pastor that have come from backgrounds where they were abused by leaders in that situation? You see, that, has, that, that doesn't address sin at all. What it does is it enables us to be superficial. So what happens when we genuinely worship, we, and you can do that in that form of worship. Don't get me wrong. It's not like that form of worship is wrong. But what I am saying is that we kind of, when it, once it becomes routine, then we pull our hearts out of it. But you have to have your heart engaged because that's where the Holy Spirit does all His work. And that's what Jesus is, is saying to this woman at the well. He goes on to say, uh, he, he, she goes on to say, the woman said, I know the Messiah is coming, the one who's called Christ. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Then Jesus told her, I am the Messiah. I'm he. Powerful stuff. I am is a term that the Jews did not use. And the reason why they didn't use it was because when Moses was talking to God at the burning bush, and he asks God at the burning bush, who shall I say you are? God's response was, I am. So that was a term that when you said, I am, I am, everybody knew that that was a term for God. So Jesus says, I am the Messiah. That was... Pfft. Goes on to say... Right about that time, it says, then, j just then his disciples came back. They were shocked to find him talking to a woman, but none of them had the nerve to ask, what, are you, what do you want with her, or why are you talking to her? The woman left her water jar beside the well and ran back to the village, telling everyone, come and see a man who told me everything I did. That's what true salvation looks like. Because she'd been washed clean through her encounter with Jesus, could he possibly be the Messiah? So the people came streaming from the village to see him. Meanwhile, the disciples were urging Jesus, Rabbi, eat something. But Jesus replied, I have a kind of food you know nothing about. Did someone bring him food while we were gone? The disciples asked each other. Then Jesus explained, My nourishment comes from doing the will of God who sent me and from finishing his work. You know the saying, four months between planting and harvest. But I say, wake up and look around. The fields are already ripe for the harvest. Every day that I drive home and I see the farmers out there, I don't think of money. I don't think of food. I think of God and His harvest every single time. And I am surrounded with this reminder that now is the time for the harvest. You know, people, people in other places, they don't really understand the harvest. They, they, you know, if you're living in L.A. and you hear this text, and they don't, but we, we get it. We get it that we look out into the fields and we see them bursting with beans or with corn, and it's time. If we don't do it, it's this idea that, that it would be a wasted harvest. And Jesus is saying, now is the time. You've got to get in there. You've got to get in the fields. You've got to get after people now is the time for the harvest he's talking to his disciples and 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 it's this urgency he goes on to say in verse 36 the harvested the harvesters are paid good wages and the fruit they harvest is people brought to eternal life do you know that you have a message and that message is about eternal life how many Christians completely take grace for granted and they don't care? Well, I don't care about that person. 
Maybe somebody will reach them. Maybe they won't. I don't care. Folks, God cares. If you care about God, then you care. He says that what joy awaits both the planter and the harvester alike. Do you think that when you're in heaven and you see people coming to heaven, do you think you're going to regret any single moment of your life that you sacrifice for Jesus? Or are you going to think to yourself, you know, I wish, really wish I'd spent more time on vacation. When you see people entering into heaven, and one of the reasons why they're there is because God used you to witness to them. God used you. Maybe it was a day, I don't care what you were doing. Maybe it was a day that you were working in the kitchen. And somebody came to church and they ate something and it made them feel welcome. It made them feel good and that began the process. And maybe they walked up the stairs and there was a greeter who shook their hand and said, welcome. And maybe they came in and there was an usher that took them to their seats. Or they got to hear somebody in the tech booth, uh, you know, playing music or somebody on the stage, whatever it is. The point is, is that that is what God wants to do in the lives of people. And we forget that then we've forgotten everything. Jesus went out of his way to reach this Samaritan woman. He could have, you know, it didn't matter that she was a Samaritan. He went anyway. He goes on to say that, you know the saying, one plants and another harvests, and that is true. I sent you to harvest where you didn't plant. Others had already done the work, and now you will get to gather the harvest. Verse 39, many Samaritans from the village believed in Jesus because the woman had said, he told me everything I ever did. When they came out to see him, they begged him to stay in their village. So he stayed for two days, long enough for many more to hear his message and believe. Then they said to the woman, now we believe, not just because of what you told us, but because we have heard him ourselves. Now we know that he is indeed the Savior of the world. Jesus had just left Jerusalem, and Jerusalem was filled with church people. And they rejected him. There's a party going on in this village. It's a salvational party. And the church people missed it. Because they were hanging back in Jerusalem, and they just thought, well, if God's going to do anything, he's going to do it here. No, he did it in Samaria. And we have to know. Last week, you know, when I talked to you, if you were here, I talked about this circle, this grace circle, and how uh, we stand in it and we feel this favor and this blessing and joy from God. Well, this circle moves. This circle moves. It goes wherever God wants it to go. Now, what do we do? Well, sometimes we hunker down. We say, well, God was here at one time, so, you know, I'll just stay here until he comes back. Or we kind of walk in whatever direction we want, and we expect God to follow us along and just bless us everything that we do. When in reality, what God is doing is He's saying, follow me. I've got a plan. I want you to go here. I want you to follow me there. Here, this is where we're going to go today. We're going to go into a bar. Here, this is where we're going to go. We're going to go to this place. Now we're going to go to that place. We're going to go here. We're going to go there. This is what we're going to do because I want to save people. And Christians say, nah, you know what, I got a good seat. It's comfortable here. I'll just hang out right here. Lord, you you do your thing. You let other people do it. I'll just ride out my life until heaven. Folks, wake up and look around you. The fields are ripe for the harvest. And Jesus is relentlessly got his arms out and he's saying come to me the way has been made you don't have to make it yourself you don't have to go out there and earn it yourself but you do have to turn to god and so this is where we are as a people either we have turned to god or now we are a part of jesus's invitation to come back where are you at let's pray Father God, I thank you for your word today. And Lord, I do ask.
that we as a people would wake up, Lord, if we are in a place of complacency, or even if we are at a place where we have just totally forgotten about grace and totally uh, just into whatever it is that we're into, Lord, my prayer is, is that we would wake up and we would realize what you are doing. Lord Jesus, give us a passion for what you are passionate about. Help empower us to not be people of complacency, but to be people of action. Lord, there are brothers and sisters out there right now waiting for your message. May we have the boldness to proclaim it. We pray this in your name, Lord Jesus. Amen. We're going to invite you now to respond as the Spirit leads you. If you'd like to receive communion, you can come forward and receive that. We also have prayer available, but this is one of those moments. Worshiping in spirit. Right, right in here. As Matt and the praise team, when they sing these songs, or these words, this is where you want to be. Right here. Jesus is going to meet you there. He's going to reveal things about yourself to yourself because he wants to heal you and he wants to set you free. So let's worship him in spirit and in truth together. So we, we have this picture of grace. You know, a wise man once said that in order to understand the good news, you first have to understand that there is bad news. And so we see a message like this. And, you know, it, it kind of touches us in kind of a deep place because maybe we can relate to this woman in various ways. But the good news is that that does not define you. He called her a dear woman, dear daughter, dear a term of endearment. You see, grace. We, we can do these things that we feel ashamed about. And God can look at us and say, my son, my daughter, it's not, it, 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 that's the power of grace. So I want you to hear, when you hear something here, I don't want you walking out here thinking, oh man, that really convicted me and, and I feel so ashamed. No, don't. You need to leave here saying, wow, look at how Jesus loved that woman. Look how he had this, 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 this appreciation for her. He was filled with grace. And so as you do leave here today, you know that that same grace applies to you. When you turn to Jesus, you are forgiven, you are washed clean, and you are pure. And that's just the way it is. That's the power of the gospel. So please stand and receive this blessing as you leave here today. As you leave here, as God's redeemed holy people, I pray that you would leave here now knowing the love of God the Father, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ the Son, and the fellowship and the power of the Holy Spirit now and always. God bless you. You're dismissed. Have a great week.